Welcome to The Epic Life with Pastor Bob Hallman. We invite you to listen to this timeless and inspirational message from God's Word. May the Holy Spirit encourage and strengthen your heart today. A particular uh, type of gift, the elitist gift, that if you don't have it, somehow you're not really a believer, somehow you're not really a Christian. Of course, those things aren't true. We know that. But as we watch that kind of abuse... The rest of us who believe in the gifts because they're scriptural, they're they're laid out for us uh, repeatedly in the Bible, the rest of us acknowledge them, but then we shy away from using them, and we're not exactly how to use them in a biblical way without coming off as, as kind of flaky and weird, and without being a participant in the abuse of the gifts. And so many of us, Uh, myself included for years, assented to the gifts and acknowledged them, but in my actual practice, they just didn't, I just didn't find them working themselves out very often in my life or in the lives of the people that I was ministering to and the fellowships that I was leading. And I'm convinced that that's a, a, a tactic of the enemy to get us to take off the tool belt that God has given us for building the kingdom of God. If, if he can get us to take off the tools that are God-given for the building of the kingdom, which is what the Bible says the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for, they're temporary, When Christ comes, they'll be shed off. They'll be no more. They won't be necessary because the building of the kingdom will be finished at that point. I was doing a funeral yesterday, and uh, two of the points that God put on my heart to share with people is, is to be concerned about the legacy you're leaving and also be concerned about your eternal destiny. So your earthly legacy and your eternal destiny, and those, those are things that we too need to be concerned about. But right now, right now today, And this week and the next week and the next week, this is the time to do God's work. Because there will come a time, either through our own death or through the coming of Christ, when the work will be finished. And at that point, the gifts will be no more. They won't be necessary. Why? Because God has given us the gifts for the building of his kingdom. And when he comes or we die, our participation in that kingdom building activity comes to closure. And so the gifts aren't necessary. And so the gifts... Our, as I've mentioned, I'm, for those of you that have been here, please forgive me. It's probably not bad to review. But the gifts are like a tool belt. And we go to the job site with this tool belt on. And we don't stand out on the job site and show off our tool belt. We go out with the tools we need and we go out for the purpose of getting the job done. And those tools are nothing more than that. They're strictly tools. We don't glory in them. We don't magnify them. We don't show off. We don't compare ourselves with others and say, how come your tool belt isn't as flashy as mine? Or how come you don't have this particular tool? You know, you really aren't a, a real contractor if you don't have this tool. Without this tool, you're, you're really, I'm, I, gee, I don't even know if you should be on the job site, for goodness sakes. And we do this kind of stuff in the body of Christ, which is totally, totally wrong. It's sinful and it's wicked. But it fits so perfectly with Satan's wonderful plan for the church, which is to destroy it and to thwart God's work. Now, can you see that if we have been given this mighty, wonderful, awesome responsibility and privilege of building the kingdom, and God has given us this particular tool belt, some of us are like plumbers, some are electricians, some are carpenters, some are drywallers, some are are roofers, some are landscapers, some lay asphalt, some lay foundations, We all have different tool belts on, and we're not expected to do all of the ministry of the church. And so we come with this God-given tool belt to do the work, but, but out of our own fear, because of the abuse of the gifts, we take off our tool belt and say, well, I, I believe in tools, but I really am not comfortable using them, because some guys I saw one time got the hammer and put it through the big pane glass of window, and I saw another guy get shocked to death. He got electrocuted because he was, he was abusing the tools that he had and wasn't being wise in how he was using them. And so all of us say, okay, well, gee, you know, boy, a hammer can be really dangerous. Everybody turn in your hammers right now. We believe in hammers, but I want you to put them up on the altar. No more hammers on this job site because they're dangerous. They can be abused. People could get hurt. Buildings could fall. Things could collapse. And so we take off the very tools that God has given us for the building of the kingdom. And it's not because we don't want to do God's will. It's just that we're so afraid of not finding the right balance. And so that's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks is having a biblical perspective on the gifts. The thing that I've, uh, that I've laid out over the last couple of weeks is that, and I, I forgot my overhead, but uh, you'll have to visualize with me. Visualize a pyramid. And the, and the first level of this, of this structure is love. 
Now, the Bible says that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to be exercised with the motivation and out of the foundation of love, agape love, selfless love, a love that's not self-seeking, not self-serving, not rude, not arrogant, not boastful, not proud, all the things that love is. That foundation is from which is, is the foundation from which we exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and if that love is missing, and sometimes it is in the body of Christ, and we still try to exercise the gifts, I guarantee you the gifts will be abused because they're not being generated out of a love for the body of Christ. And as I've said, you cannot love someone unless you get close to them. And love is not a feeling, it's a behavior, it's an action, it's a decision to give yourself away to another person, to lay your life down for someone else. And so as, you, as we exercise the gifts that God has given us, the, this holy tool belt for building the kingdom, and, and, and we meet somebody that has a need or is, needs a word from God or they need some sort of encouragement or edification or building up, and we see that person and we love them because they're our brother or our sister in Christ, and we come to that person and out of love we're wanting to lift them because we love them. We're not lifting ourselves. We're not exalting ourselves, and we're certainly not lifting the gift and exalting the gift, but we want to lift that person. We want to get down low. We want to... We want to get beneath them and lift them. And so the foundation of the gifts, and it talks about this in every passage on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what's just all over and surrounding the context of the gifts? It's love. If we have all the gifts in the world, but we don't have love, the Bible says, get off the job site. It's worthless. It's meaningless. Now, the second layer that the Bible lays out, that Paul lays out consistently when he's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit besides love, is that we've got to have a knowledge and a lifestyle of acknowledging the interdependence of the body of Christ. And Paul says again and again, not everybody's a foot, not everybody's a hand, not everybody's an eye. We all have different parts and functions in the body of Christ. Every one of us are different. And you know what? God gave you the gifts that he wanted to give you. He's especially equipped you to be a part of the ministry of this fellowship, or if you're from the mainland and another church, the ministry of your fellowship. He has, as Scripture says, divinely arranged you and put all these pieces together so that they fit perfectly to accomplish this great plan that he's got in this world to build the kingdom of God. But if we're disconnected and the foot says, hey, I don't need you. Hey, I don't want to be accountable to you. I'm not going to be transparent. I just want to sit in the pew and I want to go out and I want to have nothing to do with the rest of the body. And the Bible says that's wrong. That's wrong thinking. And a lot of people do that, unfortunately. And, you know, I try to communicate to people who, haven't, who don't go to church regularly. I, I, I've been there. I've, there have been times in my life where I haven't gone to church regularly either as a Christian. Got discouraged, got hurt, you know. We've all had those things happen to us. But when I remove myself from the body of Christ, I'm just thinking mostly about myself. I'm thinking, okay, I, I don't really, I'm not comfortable there. Or I don't want to go or I, you know, I'm, I'd rather go surfing or scuba diving or something else. But the fact is, when I remove myself, I am, I am removing from that particular group of, of people in the fellowship a very important component. Not that I'm important or that you're important, but God has arranged you and divinely equipped you and gifted you so that you can have your part in the church. And if you're not there, then you're missing out on all the things that God has for you through the rest of the body of Christ. And this is a very, very different concept from our North American view of, of living. We are independent. We don't want to lean on anyone. We certainly don't want to open our hearts to anyone. We certainly don't want to be accountable to anyone. But if we want to really live the Christian life and use our gifts as God has intended them, we must have God's view about the body of Christ and Paul's view. And that view is that we're interdependent. We need each other. And God, oh, I just love this. You know, he doesn't give any one of us all the gifts because then we wouldn't need each other. You know that he has given you a certain number of gifts but hasn't given them all so that you would not be independent of the rest of the body of Christ of which you are a part. And so we've got love. The gifts cannot operate properly or biblically unless love is the motivating factor of the use of those gifts. 
The second layer is what I've just explained, that we have to have a sense of interdependence on God and an interdependence on one another. It's God's design for the church. That means we have to get close and love each other genuinely, really, authentically. And then the last layer that I talked about is the gifts themselves. Now, the gifts themselves, as I've already said, are they're temporary. They're not here forever. They're just here for a short period of time during this, during this window of opportunity that God has given us to proclaim his name and the gospel of Christ. And they, these gifts are, are for the building up, the edification, as I spoke last week, of the body, sometimes to mend a broken bone, sometimes to, to take nasty, gnarly fish out of our nets that have gotten caught in there in our spiritual nets, and we need brothers and sisters to come along and help us to get those, that spiny fish that's torn our net and to take it out and then mend the net. They're all different descriptions, but as I said last week, the most important thing that we can do if we want to use the gifts is not to focus on the gifts themselves. See, everybody, that's a big problem in the church is that people get focused on the gifts, and they're like, the gift is like, you know, it's the gift, it's the gift, it's this gift, it's that gift, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But that completely derails us from God's purpose. The focus is on the kingdom of God, the expansion of his glorious kingdom. That's the focus. And as we focus on that and we're rightly related to one another and we've got agape love flowing through us and, we, and you've got to get close to have that happen. But as we get close and agape love is flowing and we're serving one another and we're being interdependent and then all of a sudden a need arises in the fellowship and someone's hurting, oh, we, get, we gather around that person. And then we lift that person up and we pray for them and God might give a word of knowledge or a scripture or a prophecy or God might put it on one of our hearts who have the gift of helps or service to help that person in a very practical way. But see, it's not some hocus-pocus kind of thing where we all of a sudden shift in our relationship with God from God the Father, God the Son, and whoop, turn the lights down low, everybody be quiet, the Holy Spirit's going to move. Oh. You know? And that's kind of how it is sometimes. And as I explained, I believe that the work of the Holy Spirit is seamless with the work of God the Father and God the Son. It's just a, it's a flow. It's a ministry of all three together working and doing their, their fabulous supernatural work. But it's not, it's not some scary thing that it's been turned into. Some, some kind of a, a fix-all that, that if you just go to this meeting or that meeting and get this particular gift or that particular gift, your Christian life is just going to take off. And that's not true. It might encourage you. It might build you up. But a gift will not be the foundation and the grist of your personal walk with God. It's Jesus. It's him alone. It's being close to him. It's being in the word of God. It's praying. It's worshiping. It's evangelizing. These are the foundations of our faith. And the gifts are merely tools, temporary, to build us up. For me to say to you, keep going, sister. Keep going, brother. And not me saying it, but God saying it through me to you. Exhorting you, encouraging you, imparting some word of, of exhortation, some word of knowledge, some word of prophecy. And for me as a pastor teacher to teach you the biblical truths of faith and, and just keep you moving toward Christ and realizing that he is the goal. That is the goal. But the church has been derailed in the gifts and been distracted by the gifts and the gifts have become the objective. They've become the end in themselves. And that's why you see people flocking to different meetings all over the country wanting to get some gift in the hopes that that gift will, will somehow fill the, the vacuum of joylessness in their life. But they won't be filled by that gift. It'll be filled by God, by a close, ever-drawing close relationship with Jesus Christ. And the gift is a tool. You know, imagine me going to the job site with my, with my tool belt and, and some guy is having a difficult time in life. And I tell him, hey, brother, you know what you're missing? You're missing a hammer. If you just had a hammer... If you just had my hammer, your life would just take off. I mean, of course, we know that's ridiculous. What that man needs is he needs more of Jesus. He needs an overflow of the living water of Christ. And certainly a part of that is the work of the Holy Spirit. But what he doesn't need is a hammer to give him joy. He needs a hammer to get a job done. And so God gives us those tools to magnify himself and thrust forward the kingdom of God. And what I want to talk to you about today briefly is the use and operation of the gifts. And actually, this is a two-parter because it was too long to, uh, to try to fit into one session. And we'll cover the rest of it next week. And if you're helped by notes, you can feel free to go through these. We'll, we'll go through them quite quickly. But Paul's view of the spiritual gifts 
was, was that, first of all, if you look in your notes here, the gifts are given to the body of Christ. They are for the edification or the building up of the whole body, not merely for the enjoyment or enrichment of the individual member possessing them. And it doesn't mean that we op- when we operate in the gifts that we don't experience joy in using them. Any one of you who have ever been used by God knows that there's a tremendous joy when God uses you to help someone else. But that's not the objective. The objective is helping the other person know Christ. No one person has all the gifts, as it says in 1 Corinthians 12. Consequently, the individual members of the church need each other. And I'm just reiterating what I've already said. Although not equally conspicuous, all the gifts are equally important. You know, there, there's some gifts that are just more obvious than others. And oftentimes the body of Christ doesn't, doesn't properly honor the less conspicuous gifts, but we must. And those of you that have gifts that you think are small and, gee, I'm kind of, I, I, I can't speak publicly and I, I don't know the gift of prophecy and I don't speak in tongues and I don't do these different things. All I know how to do is to cook meals. I'm a great cook, but what good is that? And I'm, oh, that's a great gift. That's a wonderful gift. The gift of hospitality, the gift of helps, the gift of service. So we, we're, it's important that we not uh, minimize those gifts, but, but thank God that he's given us that gift and, and thank him that he's orchestrated and arranged us just perfectly according to his will that we would use those gifts for his purpose and for the building of the kingdom. And uh, finally, under D, it's the Holy Spirit who distributes these various gifts to whom he will and when he wants to. And, um, and that's what we, what we uh, read here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me just read this briefly. It says, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God who works all of them in all men. Now to, teach one, now to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To, to one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the same and one Spirit. To another miraculous powers and to another prophecy. To another distinguishing between Spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues and still... Uh, another in the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of the one and same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. So the gifts are a gift. That's why, isn't that funny they call them gifts? I mean, it kind of works, doesn't it? They're a gift. We don't earn them. That We don't work for them. We don't merit them. They are a gift. And they're not for us. And that's a key thing. The gift that God has given you is not for you. Any gift that you have is for someone else. You're a conduit. You're God's spokesperson. You're God's hands. You're God's feet. And God has specially appointed you, each one of us, to use our gifts for the building up the body of Christ. There's a, a great quote by um, Millard Erickson who's written um, a book on Christian theology. And I want to read it to you because I think it's so good. Uh, I'll, I'll slow down and read it because it's, uh, it's about uh, probably about eight, eight or nine sentences. He says, we are never commanded by Scripture to be baptized in or by the Holy Spirit. Rather, he gives them the gifts sovereignly. He alone determines the recipients. If he chooses to give us a special gift, he will do so regardless of whether we expect it or seek it, although the Bible does tell us that we are to seek the gifts. What we are commanded to do in Ephesians 5.18 is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's a present imperative. It means that it's a suggesting an ongoing action that we are to be filled. We're commanded to continually, ongoingly be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this isn't so much a matter of our getting more of the Holy Spirit because presumably all of us possess the Spirit in his entirety. And Scripture teaches that. When, if we are, have the Spirit of Christ, if you've come into the kingdom, you've been invested and endowed and sealed with the Holy Spirit. You've got all of him. But he goes on and says it's rather a matter of possessing mo- him possessing more of our lives. That's what the Holy Spirit needs to do. He needs to possess more of us. We've got all of him. But undoubtedly, he doesn't have all of us or we'd be perfect. Each one of us is to aspire to giving the Holy Spirit full control of our lives. 
When that happens, our lives will, be manifest, uh, will manifest whatever gifts God intends for us to have, along with all the fruit and acts of his empowering that he wishes to display through us. Isn't that good? I think that's so solid and so scriptural. So we're to seek to be men and women who have more and more and more of God's work happening in our life, not because it's incomplete, but because we are incomplete. Our hearts are incomplete. And, and we've got to make room for him by, by getting rid of other things that are crowding into our lives, whatever that may be, so that we are more and more submitted to that work of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a number of terms that, uh, that Paul uses for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I, I'm just going to go through this briefly. I've given you a number of references there, and you can look at this at your leisure. One of the uh, terms is gifts, and it comes from the word charismata, which we get, get charismatic from. It's, uh, it's a gift. Another word is ministries, uh, under two. Another is workings, just these different types of workings of the Holy Spirit. And then there's work, administration and stewardship is another gift. And the gift of service, these are other descriptions, they're terms that are used for the, for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there, there are five things that I think are important to consider as we look at the gifts. The first is that no attempt should be made to reduce the gifts of the Spirit to a single concept or definition. And unfortunately, throughout, uh, I would say, the last 20 or 30 years, there has been an effort at different points and in different areas of the country to reduce the gifts of the Spirit to a singular definition. For instance, tongues, for a long time, was like that was the litmus test for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't hear people saying, what? You don't have the gift of helps? My gosh, brother, do you know that you're hardly saved? Do you know what you're missing out on? Can you, oh, we, everybody gather around. This brother doesn't have the gift of mercy or helps. We've got to pray for him because until he has that, he can't really experience God's anointing. Well, we kind of laugh because why is the gift of tongues singled out for this one aspect or experience of the Holy Spirit? That's reducing God's overall work and overall plan to one guy's tool belt and saying this one guy, we've all got to be like this one guy. And the Bible clearly tells us that's not true. Paul says, not all speak in tongues. We all have different gifts. And so uh, we, we need to be very careful not to reduce the gifts of the Holy Spirit to any one. Another one that's kind of going through the churches right now is the gift of laughter. And, and the whole body of Christ has, uh, is watching this, seeing it unfold, and, and the gift of laughter, it's being, it's, this one gift is reducing the entire work of the Holy Spirit to this one gift that you've got to have if you're going to experience the outpouring of God. And that's just not true. That's a misuse of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to reduce it to a singular gift and a singular definition. And it points to one gift and says, you've got to have this tool belt. You've got to have it. And without it, in fact, I'm not even sure you're saved. You see how silly that is? But that's why it's so important not to reduce the gifts of the Spirit to a singular definition, but to incorporate the broad perspective that God has on the use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The second thing is it's not clear whether these gifts are endowments from birth, special enablement received at some later point, or a combination of the two. Now, I know some of you, if I were in your shoes and I heard that, I would be going, ooh, my ears would perk up and I'd say, what is he going to say? Because I'm not sure I agree with this. Without question, every gift that we have is from God. They're given by the Holy Spirit. But oftentimes, the gifts flow very naturally with the natural talents and abilities that we have as well. For instance, the gift of mercy. The people who I know who are merciful, many, many, many of them were merciful before they came to Christ. And they loved to help people. They were good people. And they would do, they'd lay their life down for other people. And they, get, they come to Christ, and all of a sudden, God in, in, imbues this gift with even more power and more mercy and more love. But the gift was kind of already there. It was kind of a part of their personality. Now, some of you are artistic, and I believe that's a gift. And you can use that for God's glory, but that gift was already there. It was kind of latent in your, in, in your natural self. And so some gifts, I believe, are, are a part of God's natural gifting of us as his creation. But when we come into a relationship with Christ, all of a sudden it takes on a whole new meaning. You know, we're not doing it for ourselves. We're not doing it for money. We're not doing it for any of these things anymore, but we're doing it for the glory of God. Now, there's certain gifts that are clearly not exercised prior to conversion, like the gift of prophecy. And for many people like pastor and teacher, you know, you don't, you don't usually kind of just, you know, gee, get up on a, 
uh, go out on the corner and not saved and have no interest in the things of the kingdom and start preaching. That, that's something that generally happens after you're saved. So there are certain gifts that, uh, that are more natural, and those, those, I think, are sometimes just a part of the character and nature that God has given us. And there are those gifts that are, that are very supernatural. Not that they all aren't, but from a human perspective, they, they tend to be perceived as more, spirit, more supernatural. The third thing is that uh, some gifts, such as faith, evangelism, service, and there are a whole lot of others we could include there, are qualities and activities expected of every Christian. So, for instance, I may not have the gift of mercy, but I'm fully expected as a Christian to exercise mercy in my dealings with others. You may not have the gift of evangelism, but you are fully responsible and called upon by God to evangelize. So even though we may not be particularly gifted, it may not be like a real green light for us, we're still required and, and responsible. So we can't, you know, I've been in churches, in fact, I was a part of one, <laughs> where, you know, it was the evangelism committee and the, the hospitality committee, and they had all these committees, and it gave everyone else in the church kind of the sense of permission that all this stuff is going to get taken care of, and we don't really need to be involved in that ministry. And that's just not true. Number four, since none of the four lists in the Bible regarding the gifts includes all of the gifts found in the other lists, it's quite conceivable that collectively they don't exhaust all possible gifts of the Spirit. They are more likely illustrative of the various gifts with which God has endowed the church. So, if you're artistic and you love, like Michelle, for instance, she, she designed the, the dove and behind me and the t-shirts and everything, but that's not listed in, in, in the four passages on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Does that mean it's not a gift? No. I believe, let me give you my definition of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. A gift is anything, anything, any resource, any ability, any talent, anything that you've got, anything that God has given you that will lift others up and thrust them forward, forward in the kingdom of God in that mission. So if you've got a gift of, art, of, of being an artist and, and people look at what you've done and it, and, it, and it pushes and advances the kingdom forward, that's a gift. Use it for God's glory. The gift of music is not listed in Scripture, but certainly we would all agree that when someone is gifted in music, they usher us toward the presence of God and we want more of Him. That's a gift. Anything at your disposal, anything, anything can be used for God's glory. And if it can be, it's given as a tool for you for the building of the kingdom of God. Now, the final thing is that a believer's ability to discover and biblically exercise his or her spiritual gifts is normally in direct proportion to his or her agape love for others. And this gets back to what I've already said, agape love. It's in direct proportion to that person's in interdependence within the body of Christ. It's directly proportional to that person's participation in the Great Commission. You know why the gifts of the Spirit are not necessary in many churches? They're not building anything. They might be building buildings, but they're not building the kingdom of God. One of the churches that I, that I was in for a period of time, I, I just my mouth dropped and hit the floor. We had a, a meeting, an annual, an annual meeting for the whole church, and a reams of, you know, paper with everybody's report of who was doing what. You get to the end of that, and uh, of course we went through the budget, and you go through the hospitality committee, and the evangelism committee, and the missions committee, and that committee, and that committee, and you know, you go through all the committees, and when you're all done, they get to the point of, uh, of looking at new converts, and they had five for the year. Uh, with a, it wasn't a large church, it was 300 people, but they had a very large, they had about a $400,000 budget. It was a wealthy church. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, we got five converts and $400,000 that we spent. <laughs> Do the math. I mean, that's an expensive convert. Isn't that what the church is supposed to be about? But you see that if we're not using the gifts and we have no intention of being a part of this great, awesome, magnificent, great commission, winning men and women to Christ, we don't even need the gifts because we're not building anything. And if we're not building, the gifts are pointless. And that's why we can set them aside and churches can go on for years and years and years without even talking about the gifts or exercising the gifts or even thinking about the gifts. But if we're going to build the kingdom, we've got to use the tools God has given us. And if some nut 
or some new Christian or someone that's not familiar with the gifts goes and knocks a hole in the wall, that's not reason for us to take our tool belts off. We need to come alongside that person and say, brother, you know that really a hammer isn't for putting through drywall unless you're doing, doing demolition. A hammer is for construction. So we come alongside people like that. We don't reject them. We come alongside and say, hey, brother or sister, this is really a more proper use of that particular tool if you want to be effective in building this house. Now, there will be people that, that come in who are wolves into the, into the church, and they aren't really interested in being instructed. They have one desire, and that's to tear down what God is building. And we can be patient with those people for a brief period of time as we're determining where their hearts are really at. But if it becomes clear that their heart isn't in building but tearing down, that person is not welcome in the fellowship because we have a divine mission by God. Very much like Nehemiah. He didn't invite all these people into the church and say, or into his mission and say, oh yeah, Tobiah and all you guys that hate what we're doing. Yeah, God, we don't want to offend you. Well, yeah, you can come on in. Yeah, sure, tear down the church. Rip it down. Rip down these walls. No way. He held up a shield and a sword with one hand, and with the other hand he had a trowel, and everyone else did too, and they kept building. And that's what we need to be doing. So we need to participate in this great commission if we're going to be using the gifts properly. And the fifth thing that I've listed there is that we need to be submitted and surrendered to the Holy Spirit. You know, oftentimes the, um, the Christian life really just boils down to a, a, a death to self, doesn't it? It comes down to who's in charge of our life. Is it us or is it God? And if God's in charge of our life and we've totally submitted ourselves to his work, the Holy Spirit will use us powerfully. Not because we're anything, but because he has a mission. And he's looking for available men and women who will say yes. Whatever you say, the answer is yes. Whatever you ask, the answer is yes. Whatever you request, the answer is will always and forever be yes. He's looking for men and women like that. I believe we have a church full of men and women like that. I've seen it. But I think God wants to do even a greater work in this fellowship and on this island, and for those of you that are visiting in your fellowships, but he needs men and women like you to say yes, to say yes, whatever you want. Whatever your will is, your will be done. That, the example that, of course, we have is Jesus. All he did, his whole ministry, was say yes. Yes, yes, yes. Your will be done. Jesus never drew attention to himself. He never complained. He never griped. He never moaned about how people weren't serving him, how people weren't doing what he wanted, how people weren't loving him. He just had compassion. He had a heart for the world, for the lost. And we are the product of that heart if you've committed your life to Christ. Now, I want to just finish by by giving you a, a litmus test for examining the gifts and how they're exercised. And I have to tell you, for those of you that are, are visiting us for the first time, I'm usually an expository verse-by-verse -verse teacher. But as we've been going through this uh, 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 lesson on the Holy Spirit, we, we've been um, covering a whole lot of scriptures, so we haven't been going verse-by-verse. -verse. But the, the uh, five points here that I've got, along with the other things that I've mentioned here today, are actually a very, very, very easy way to measure whether God is really in something or not. For instance, if you have a person come in that wants to put a lot of attention on a particular gift, and one of the gifts that's going through the church even right now at large is prophecy. That's another real emphasis. Nothing wrong with prophecy. In fact, Paul says that we should desire. He wants everyone to prophesy, and we should be praying for it. It's one of the most helpful gifts in the church. But if a person is constantly drawing attention to themselves about prophecy, right away you know something's wrong because it's not being exercised in agape love. Because agape love is not self-seeking. It's not rude. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not arrogant. It, it seeks to lift others, not to lift itself and exalt itself. And so right away you can see, oh my goodness, there's not a lot of love in the way this gift is being presented. And, and it doesn't mean it's not from God, but it just means that a little red flag goes up. And we say, let's watch and see what's really happening here. If you look down at the next one, it's, it's interdependence in the body of Christ. There are many people inside and outside the church, but especially outside the church, who, are, who claim to know Christ, who are not a part of any body. 
And there, there's no submission to any authority. There's no accountability. And they just kind of go from place to place sharing their gift and, and uh, sometimes in, in a not a very helpful way. And they're not tied into any local church. And when that happens, a red flag goes up for me. And it should for you too. What, something's not right with this because the body is, the gifts are to be exercised in agape love and, and within the context of a, of a local church. It doesn't mean that you can't go out uh, if you have the gift of prophecy or, or some other gift of healing that you can't go out and exercise it elsewhere. But it means that somehow there's a, gov- there's a body of believers that you're tied into who knows what you're doing, who prays for you, who you're accountable to. Now, the third thing is the participation of the Great Commission. There are so many meetings that are being held all over the country whose focus is not the Great Commission, but it's the gift. It's, I, I just read a brochure that was sent in my mailbox the other day. It's like, come and get healed. Come and get healed. And again, nothing wrong with healing. God does heal, and he uses that gift of healing. But it's like the motivation isn't get healed so that you can expand the kingdom, or let's, let's, help, help, let, let's ask God to relieve you of this infirmity so that you can be freed up physically to, to be a part of that great commission. No, it just kind of ends there. It's like the, the, it's a dead end. The dead end is the healing itself. And that, that rush of feeling that God loves you and is doing something. But if the great commission is not a part of the use of the gifts, then a little red flag needs to go up in our hearts and say, I'm not saying it's not of God, but something's not quite, the, the fullness of God's purpose for the gifts is not being properly exercised. The, the, uh, the, I for, forgot one here. Number four, emotional and spiritual maturity. That's so essential. And when we have those gifts, especially those gifts, but I, I say to you all the gifts, we need to be solidly grounded in Scripture. And we need to know the Word of God very well and be growing in that Word so that we can properly exercise the gifts, so that we ourselves can have a, che- a system of checks in our heart against the Scripture so that as we're exercising our gifts, we can say, okay, now... The gifts of tongues really is not for exhorting anyone. It's for declaring the glory of God. And I talked to someone just uh, this week that, that thought the gifts of, gift of tongues was for prophecy. And it's not. The gift of tongues clearly is to glorify God. That's its one function and purpose. So if somebody starts talking in tongues and tells me the interpretation is, you know, you've got to change, brother, I know right away. And that's why they too need to know the word of God so they can measure everything that they're doing against Scripture. Let me close with this. I'm, I'm just scanning and I'm looking at each of you in here. And as I look at you, I see a gift to the body of Christ. I see a man and a woman who God wants to use for his eternal purposes. And the time is short. None of us, I don't care how young you are, or how old you are, you, we have no guarantees whatsoever except that when our time comes, God will take us but we have no guarantees. In the meantime, let's get busy building God's kingdom. Let's be busy about his business. And the way for that to happen is to completely love the body of Christ. Love unbelievers. Give ourselves sacrificially. We can't live for ourselves. We can't focus on ourselves any longer as true believers. And then accept and embrace the interdependence of the body of Christ and then use the gifts that God has given you. Give it away. Freely you have received. Give it away. Don't hold anything. Give it away. Find ways that you can minister this week. Find ways that you can bless. Find ways that you can lift others up. Forget about yourself. Stop talking about yourself. Stop thinking about yourself. Stop being embroiled in all of your problems and start giving away the rich resource that God has given you because the time is short. I don't know how long it'll be. Maybe it'll be 10 years. Maybe it'll be 100 years. But I know for me, the time is short. At best, I've got maybe 40 years, maybe 45 that's a short time. For those of you that are older, you know how fast time goes. It's short. Give yourself to those things that last forever. And don't shy away from the gifts. Don't pull away from them. Learn how to exercise them biblically in agape love, in the context of the body of Christ, and for the building of God's eternal kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. Oh, God, how tangled we've become over the gifts. How confused the body of Christ has been over something so precious and so wonderful and yet so temporary. And God, the, the church, we all together have, have shied away because of abuse that we've seen, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would 
help us to realize that this is Satan's great strategy to get us to take our tool belts off so that we have no resources for which to build the kingdom. And God, I pray that you would show each one of us, Lord. I think it's very natural. I don't think it's some strange phenomena that happens to us that's different from our walk with you and the Father. But Lord, I think it's just a, a seamless experience of wanting to build others up and using it, whatever is at our, dis our disposal, to help another brother or sister move forward in their walk with you, that the kingdom might advance and that your glory might be made manifest and that you would draw all men and women to yourself. So, Lord, I just thank you for what you're doing, and I praise you. Oh, Lord, we worship you, and we love you. And I, I know that there's at least one person that wants to receive Christ today, and um, I don't know where he is. Can you go get Sean? He's in the Sunday school room. I know that he came up to me today. We've been praying for this brother for, oh, I don't know. How long have you guys been here, Debbie? Like almost 10 months, 11 months. How long have you been on the island? One year. We've been praying for Sean for a year, and he came up to me today. I knew something was different. He had this, he was just beaming. But he wants to commit his life to Christ. He, I have to tell you, he's, he's read all of Revelation. He's read all of Genesis. He's created games for both the high school groups, uh, uh, in order to do that, hey, brother, your time has come. Um, but we want to usher him into the kingdom today and welcome as a brother. But there may be someone else here today that doesn't know Christ. And all the things I'm talking about is just like, wow, this is so different. This is so strange. But you know what? God loves you. If you don't know him, I believe he called you specifically here today that you might come into a lasting, living, eternal relationship with him, that you actually might fulfill your destiny, your eternal destiny. And all it means is just accepting him and saying, I want you. I, I acknowledge I've sinned and I want what you want to give me. I want eternal life. I want to accept your death on the cross in my place that I can be set free for this wonderful, lasting relationship with Christ. The Epic Life is a listener-supported ministry designed to encourage and equip believers to go big for God by loving him, loving others, and making disciples. You can visit our website at theepiclife.org. God bless you.